Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I've got a terrible cold today, so I hope that I don't run out of voice before the 20 minutes are over. Apologies in advance if I do. All right, so, um, um, so thanks for being here today. I know this is a morning session and some of you, um, I think you were partying last night, so I hope you had fun. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, payment security in the future of digital money and what businesses and stakeholders alike can do to ensure that the, uh, the digital ecosystem remains secure and innovative despite the current and the future challenges. So as introduced, my name is Irene. I'm the uh, Managing Director of CashRen Europe and a co-founder. So uh, CashRen is the company behind CashShield, which is uh, the only, I mean, the first and so far the only solution, only, only online fraud protection solution fully developed in Asia. We are headquartered in Singapore, and as some speakers said uh, yesterday and today, Singapore government is well known for its commitment towards cyber protection and security. So since uh, casual inception back in 2008, we've been working hard to protect online businesses worldwide um, to ensure, to guarantee that they have a safe environment for grow their business potential and uh, in a sustainable manner. So we are a strong advocate of uh, business-centered um, fraud prevention and uh, we have taken part in different industry events. Uh, we are members of the MRC, the Merchant Risk Council, which is the largest organization for fraud and payment professionals. And we've taken part in other events, such as the uh, Washington Crowdfunding Day, which was held a couple of weeks ago at the Capitol in the US. So after this very quick introduction, let me dive into the topic straight away. So, security in payments. I understand that we've got representatives today here uh, from different industries. We've got PSPs, we've got banks, independent financial um, service providers, card issuers, online uh, merchants. But all of us here today are, have the same concern, which is uh, what can we do to ensure that the transactions are secure and legitimate? So traditionally, the way people look at payment security is, well, with more security. So initially, the two-factor authentication, or the 2FA, is um, as payments, as digital payments evolved, this 2FA uh, authentication evolved too. So we found ourselves in a situation where users are confronted with multi-factor multi authentication payment security. So currently, in uh, the current ecosystem, we've got account logins and passwords, we've got OTPs, uh, one-time passwords sent to mobile phones, We've got pins saved in databases. Uh, we've got digital fingerprint submission. We've got submission of IDs um, or any other piece of personal information. We even have this. This happened for real. This is one of our teammates. He was requested by an online business to uh, submit a picture taken of himself holding his passport to prove his identity. So this multi-factor, or I would say it's a multi, multi, multi-factor um, uh, authentication help secure payments to an extent. But the problem is, is that it disrupts and it alters the experience of users. And it has a very huge impact on the ability of services to attract users to those services. So a good example of how this can be, um, how, how, this, uh, how users experience is uh, disrupted is 3DS, which I'm sure is a procedure that all of us are familiar with. So just to give you some figures, uh, this has been taken from uh, some surveys by, um, by Aiden and uh, by Ingenico, which are one of the two of the European, largest European PSPs. So as you can see, merchants in Brazil experienced a, a drop of 55 per, uh, uh, a drop of 55 percent in the conversion rate after implementing 3DS, and merchants in the U.S. and China experienced a drop of 43 percent in their conversion rates. So these are the U.S. Uh, China and Brazil, which are three of the largest markets in, um, in the world. And we might think that for larger tickets, users are more willing to go through uh, authentication. But the truth is that 61% of the airlines surveyed by Ingenico experienced a 10% drop in the conversion rates after implementing 3DS. So it kills the conversion rate, um, it bothers the user, and the real problem is that it doesn't really curb the sophistication of the fraud attacks. So sadly, all this multi-factor authentication that we are used to is not enough to uh, fight against the sophistication of the attacks. 
And what needs to be done is something else. We need to go beyond that. So um, authentication and payment security needs to be complemented with a comprehensive uh, approach to fraud prevention, an approach that includes behavior analysis, pattern recognition, and monitoring. So that sounds really good. But how can we apply this? How can we uh, make this comprehensive approach? Well, there are two key elements here, which I'm sure that you are familiar, very familiar with. One is big data, and the second element is machine learning. So let's start with the first, big data. Um, you are familiar with it, so I'll, we, I will go very quickly through it. Uh, what big data, what sets big data apart from traditional data is basically the three Vs. So the volume uh, refers to the amount of data, so only big only really large uh, volumes of data process can be considered big data. Second one is velocity, which determines the speed at which the data is sent to the servers and back. And the third V uh, refers to variety, or the ability to allow different, um, different types of data to be analyzed. So the good thing about big data is that it can be used strategically to make better decisions, and it can be applied to fraud management. So we discovered over the years that um, applying big data to fraud prevention just by using um, data mining or KDD, knowledge discovery from database, and combining it with external uh, databases like blacklists or whitelists um, are not enough to fight against the sophistication of fraud because, for example, a whitelisted credit card can always get compromised in any security breach. And blacklists are pretty much obsolete since the amount of stolen data is so much that fraudsters do not really need to use the same credit card twice. So something else needs to be done to um, um, needs to be done to, in order to fight um, the sophistication of the fraud attacks. So what businesses can do is uh, they can look within their own business and within their own channels. There is an abundant wealth of data that can be found within their own businesses, which can be used for fraud prevention. The marketing teams are already using this data. It can also be used for fraud management. So this is precisely the first area, the main area of application of big data into fraud prevention is uh, look inside the business and analyze the custom fields. The problem with the fraud industry is that traditionally they have only analyzed um, a limited number of a standard or of traditional fields, like the ones that you are seeing right now on the screen. And uh, that brings a bit of an issue because the data that is collected analyzing only that limited set of fields is not enough to, um, to detect fraud. And uh, it can be easily manipulated by fraudsters. And as a result, the businesses using only this uh, limited set of data um, usually fail borderline transactions. So uh, what we are suggesting is that this situation can be avoided if besides those limited data fields, we uh, businesses integrate as many custom fields as they can find within their own business, like the ones that you're seeing. Really, the list is completely unlimited because it depends on the, on the industry, it depends on the business. And I would like to take this opportunity when we are talking about big data to say that when we talk about big data uh, applied to fraud management, we are not looking for personal information. So this should be non-personal, non-sensitive information. So let me give you some examples. We've got social media. So what businesses can do is just to check whether the user has any social media profile. Um, on any social media. We are not asking, again, we are not asking you to, you know, if you get a user who shows an IP from France and the user is from the US, we're not asking you to go into the Facebook profile and check if the user has uploaded any pictures with the Eiffel Tower. No, don't do that. We are simply asking you to check the existence of a social media profile. The second one will be e-newsletter subscription, second example, which I'm sure that a lot of services offer this uh, field, so you can easily integrate this. Uh, what fraudsters do when they make an attack, they usually share some, all the orders, all the fraudulent orders usually share some similarities. So they might choose to tick or to untick this field. By adding this, you're in a better position to verify your user. And the, second, the third example will be, will be the web behavior or how the user moves. Uh, most of the attacks are generated by bots, and bots have a very mechanical way of moving around the service and around the website. So, whereas genuine users uh, will show a more natural, more nat uh, human way of moving the website. So, this is a nice, uh, it gives your business, puts your business in a very nice position to verify the users. <coughs> 
So um, you might be wondering why is it important to use uh, big data, and it's because it helps you focus only on the positive elements of uh, each transaction. The problem with the fraud protection industry is that it has focused for too long, for too much, on just uh, notifying anomalies and uh, notifying threats. And as a result, businesses end up blocking genuine customers. However, if you add all those custom fields that we were talking about earlier, you will be in a better position to look for positive elements and to look for reasons to approve transactions and to verify users. So um, enough about big data. Let's move into the second element, which is uh, machine learning. Um, again, machine learning. Um, it grew up uh, many years ago when people became more attracted to artificial intelligence and we realized that it can be applied to several fields uh, including fraud management, fraud protection. So in general, machine learning is um, the science of computers having the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed and using algorithms, machine learning allows the computer to learn from and to make predictions on data. So as fraud evolved, uh, the industry realized that rule-based solutions were not enough to, um, were no longer effective in fraud prevention. And this is what, when a new breed of solutions were created, was designed. And this new breed included predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is a subset of, um, of machine learning and it's basically the ability to make uh, predictions to uh, forecast future behavior and uh, based on past data. So true, it is true, these solutions including predictive analytics um, make a, were a step forward. However, it's not enough to detect the more sophisticated attacks and something else is needed. So a different approach to, um, to machine learning is required to combat fraud. And this approach must combine predictive analytics with pattern recognition and optimization. So why is it important to combine these three? Predictive analytics, as I said, is uh, about analyzing existing or past or documented data. And it is not able to detect the new changes or the unlabeled or undocumented data that fraudsters make in seconds. So let me illustrate this with some examples on the two areas where machine learning can be, um, can be applied for fraud verification. One is identity mapping, and the second one is uh, the detection of coordinated fraud patterns. So let's start with the first, identity mapping. Identity mapping is basically um, the, uh, the ability to recognize recurring customers when they show different information. So what happens is that for those systems that rely on, post, on past data for verifications, the means that the system doesn't have any record of the new information that is shown by the user. And so usually negative points are allocated to the user and that user might get flagged for verification, for further verification, remember the passport, or uh, he, might even bet, he might even get blocked. So the problem is how do businesses um, compensate this lack, of, this lack of technology is by building up a wall of very rigid rules to uh, block fraud. So however, when you uh, add pattern recognition to predictive analytics, identity mapping can help you to identify genuine customers which present, who present different information. And um, you can choose, or businesses can choose, with whom and how they apply the verification rules. So let's see how. So basically, it's all about building a very dynamic web of securities that avoids you to score negative points for users. So let me show you an example. We have, imagine that you have a, a business and then you, you get all these three orders. Uh, they all have different names, different email addresses, different payment methods, and different fingerprints, but they all show the same IP address. So if you are only using predictive analytics, um, chances are that all these users will get flagged or we, we might get, uh, they might get even blocked. But if you have a more comprehensive approach to machine learning and you add um, identity mapping and pattern recognition, you realize that you'll be automatically be able to connect um, or to make the connections between the points of all those three orders. And you realize that they all share the same family name. They probably are members of the same family and they're probably using the same device, which explains the same IP. So again, identity mapping can automatically help you to um, identify the points and to avoid 
new users from being blocked or from being uh, verified, further verified. The second area where machine learning can be applied is the detection of coordinated fraud patterns. Um, most of you will know that fraud is not an isolated event. Fraud happens in waves. And how fraudsters work is that they keep on trying your system. They keep on trying the systems with fraudulent order that look absolutely genuine. They try, they try, they try until they find the loophole. And once they find the loophole, they exploit it. So um, the problem with using only uh, predictive analytics is that it's very reactive. Um, so once the fraudulent order, the first fraudulent order or the first chargeback comes in, then a new set of verification rules is done or is designed according to that fraudulent order. And the problem is that fraudsters will eventually find out that new rule and they will exploit it again. So it basically creates a sort of a class 22 situation where businesses end up doing a very rigid wall of new rules and fraudsters will eventually find those rules and then they will break in the wall. You have five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, oops, perfect. <laughs> so um, if you go for machine learning, I mean, uh, the good thing for this is that um, it helps you if you, uh, if you add, it helps you identify the coordinated fraud patterns laid behind by fraudsters because there's always a pattern behind uh, every fraud attack and it helps you optimize uh, the system. So again, this is not an example. This is how fraudsters making, um, making a, lot of, um, a lot of changes into the, into the different and to different transactions. A normal system will, if you, if you add machine learning, you're able to detect all the micro changes that Froster is making to each of the different identity blocks. And you, you, you're gonna be uh, able to uh, find the D DNA profile and realize that they are, all these orders are actually matched to the same coordinated attack. Uh, this is another example, which I'm gonna skip because we don't have enough time. <laughs> So basically, um, you're probably, or you must be wondering, why am I focusing on, uh, on, on telling businesses how to protect or how to verify their users instead of telling businesses how to uh, build up systems that will prevent security breaches, which is now I want to answer that question by introducing the fraud cycle. So in the current ecosystem, we have the users uh, whose personal information is kept in databases. And upon a security breach, the hackers take all that personal information and they make it available in the illegal markets. And that information is bought by fraud syndicates. And these fraud syndicates need to monetize it. And how, to, how do they monetize the information? They basically attack online businesses. So online, once the information, once all the stolen information is over, the cycle starts again. So the problem is that online businesses are very much left uh, alone and pushed all the responsibility to them. And they implement a multi-factor authentication that we talked about earlier, which basically is not enough to, um, to fight against the sophistication of fraud. And it, helps the, it doesn't help them to grow because it doesn't help them to get new customers. So how we see the cycle, we see it in economic terms. We see the cycle with the supply, the supply side, which is uh, basically all the, the hackers making the information stolen information available. And we see the demand side, which is all the frauds in the case monetizing that stolen information. So the fraud, the comprehensive approach to fraud management that we propose uh, breaks this cycle into the demand side because the multi-factor authentication will never be able to break this cycle. However, the comprehensive approach breaks the cycle because in a way, it's basically lowering the financial incentive of uh, the monetization. So once there's no more financial incentive, once it's very difficult for fraudsters to monetize that stolen information, then the demand will be reduced. And if the demand is reduced, then the supply will be reduced too. So we are running out of time. I hope we're still on time. This is just the last slide. I would like to um, just finish this to, by sharing with you the three takeaways of this presentation. Um, FinTech is going, to be, is going to evolve to more user-centric and more collaborative services that do not require the traditional channels to succeed. And fraudsters and fraud attacks will get more frequent, more sophisticated, and will get smarter. So the security of payments in the future of digital money requires a comprehensive approach that goes beyond multi-factor authentication. Um, this applying this comprehensive approach uh, to payment security implies including m big data and machine learning. So as we have shown that these two aspects combined um, can, can build up uh, systems that are too complex for fraudsters to exploit. 
And the last is that by building this payment, uh, you businesses and fintech industry in general, we have the ability to verify users automatically. So the whole ecosystem remains profitable, secure, and sustainable. That was the last slide. I didn't run out of voice. That's very, very good news. Uh, thank you so much again for listening to us. I would like to invite now Mr. Justin Lee, who is the CEO and the brain behind Cash Shield Solution. Uh, in case you have any questions, he can help me with the questions. Thanks a lot. Any questions from the floor? Yes, can we get the mic, please? Yeah, sure. Excuse me one second. Important point is to maintain the conversion rate. That's the critical for business. Why minimizing the fraud risk? So when you perform this machine learning, and then the, what are the principal components which is most effective in preventing the fraud risk while the, the maintaining the conversion rate? So can you just uh, sort out and then the list, which is the most important in the machine learning, and then the, so can you just uh, sort out and then the important factors for conversion rate without a conversion rate and then the fraud risk? Yeah, no worries. I'll help you. Uh, th thanks a lot for the question. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, our, our standpoint for fraud prevention is always that uh, we believe in the best balance between security and convenience. Yes, we understand yeah. that. But yeah. the, what are the results? What is the most important factor yep. which do not sacrifice any conversion rate but maintaining increasing the mm -hmm. fraud risk? So can you just list the one or two top most important factors? So for us, we think that uh, surveillance is extremely important because uh, Currently, the situation is that uh, for a lot of security, it's placed in the front end. So let's say that uh, someone is able to hack into a mobile phone, everything is gone. So it's the same as uh, multi-factor authentication. So uh, once you're able to get a PIN of the 3DS payment, it's totally compromised. People will accept thousands or ten thousands without limitation. So uh, surveillance is very important, which is why we are uh, going for talks and describing that you have to add on to the element of uh, using machine to monitor behaviors because hackers are using machines to do such uh, criminal actions as well. So we feel that uh, surveillance, like uh, even for a building, uh, there's a security pass when you get in, but still traditionally there will be uh, security during patrolling around for surveillance. So this part is very, very neglected. They emphasize so much on uh, authentication that uh, uh, once it's breached, that's it. The banks, the SWIFT accounts, billions or millions of dollars get got, gone instantly. So surveillance is very, very important. In yes, thank you. So surveillance and then yep. movement behavior. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Warm hands for Irene Brine. Thank you very much.